Today on The Right Key, my guest is virtuoso of the chromatic harmonica, Gregoire Marais. A Grammy-winning musician, Gregoire's credits include Jimmy Scott, Cassandra Wilson, Madeleine Peru, Herbie Hancock, Elton John, Prince, and Sting, amongst many others. This series was conducted in the spring of 2020 via Instagram, and the audio and video quality do reflect that format. However, the words and insights of these guests are still priceless. Gregoire Moray is a Grammy-winning virtuoso of the Chromatic Harmonica, with over 170 recordings to his credit, uh, and a full history of live appearances. He's worked with artists as prominent and diverse as Pat Metheny, Madeline Peru, Jimmy Scott, Cassandra Wilson, Michelle Indigiocello, George Benson, Vanessa Williams, Herbie Hancock, Marcus Miller, Prince, Elton John, and Sting, to name a few. <laughs> <laughs> and I left that all my, otherwise we're going to be here for a long time. But, man, you know, first of all, that thing is really hard to play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has its challenges. <laughs> I mean, I guess like any other instrument, really, uh, honestly, you know, it's, um, it's just so, it's a peculiar instrument, you know. It's, it's strange because you got to blow any inhale to get different sounds. So that's, that's the thing that also throws off a lot of people when yeah. they start. You know? But I want to understand how you started, because you were in school and you studied regular music, traditional music, and were you playing piano or what? How did you start with music before you? Yeah, played I, I, well, I, I come from a, a musical background. You know, like my my father is a musician. Um, he plays banjo, and he was uh, doing quite a lot of shows uh, while I was growing up. I mean, he was playing literally every weekend. He wasn't professional, but he was playing with professional musicians, so the level was pretty high. So I got to witness like great, great music making um, since I was really a, a small, small kid, and um, that absolutely, uh, I'm sure, inspired me and and gave me gave me like the the will to to do exactly the same thing because it, it was just so magical, you know. So that's how it really started. Then in high school, I, I, that's when I really started to be serious about music. Um, I was about 15 years old when I discovered the harmonica, and I was like, this is, this is my instrument, this is me, this is what I got to do. So I started, and, and I would practice like literally all day, like eight hours a day or whatever, all night, like whenever school was finished, you know, it, it was just crazy. But I just couldn't, um, I couldn't stop. And then because of music, music, became so important for me, uh, I changed my major in, in high school to music. And then from that, I uh, decided to come and study at New York at the new school, um, yeah. got a um, degree, and then started playing around a little bit. But it, it was slow, you know, it was like everybody just being on the scene and just meeting people, meeting you actually, I think with uh, Joe Locke. You That's know? right, early on. <laughs> early I on, I was still in college. <laughs> Yeah. I want to ask you how you, but how did you learn the harmonica? Because it's not like you can say like, well, I'm going to call up my local harmonica teacher. That's you know, true. You were, uh, I, you were obviously listening to influences and you must have been listening to toots. And you know, it, yeah, I, I, I saw the first thing that happened is first, I, I, I really fell in love with the instrument, listening to a, a blues concert. Uh, and I was just blown away what, what the, the harmonica player could do. Um, then I started kind of looking around and nobody knew how to play this instrument and luckily one of the musicians was playing with my father who owned a music store taught kind of gave me the basics he knew a little bit and then he he sold me two harmonicas and one of them had this little piece of paper in it that was kind of giving me a, the instruction of how to play one single note and um that's how I really started. I just read that paper and started playing and tried to listen to whatever my the records my father owned, you know, Sonny Boy Williamson's, all these guys, and uh, copy them. And then eventually, when I was in high school later on, I discovered through a friend of mine, I discovered Toots. Because um, th this friend had um, the, the live concert of Oscar Peterson at the North Sea Jazz Festival with Toots Tillmans. And I just could not believe what I heard. I was just like, they were playing Straight No Chaser, they were playing Caravan, all, all kinds of tunes. And I, I just, I could not believe what Toots was playing. First, I didn't know who it was. I was just like, this is completely crazy. 
And then eventually when I discovered it was Toots, I just got hooked and really listened to him all the time. And then, you know, discovered other people and, and really pay attention to like the music of Miles Davis and Coltrane, you know, like everybody. But, um, and, and I would try to imitate what they were doing. So w when I finally got to the new school, one of my teachers was Reggie Workman. And um, he kind of become sort of, he kind of became sort of a mentor. And he kind of, he gave me a few um, kind of transcriptions of Coltrane's he had. And I started to see if I could apply some of the stuff Coltrane was doing on the harmonica. So it was, hours and hours and hours of practicing but eventually some of the stuff i felt i could kind of do and make musical sense you know and um and it just went from from one stage to the next like that like then eventually i met steve coleman and and he also kind of taught me a lot about the, the, his concepts and, and then I, I followed with uh robbie coltrane and and i then met um Sean Rickman, and then I met Federico Gonzalez Pena, who was playing with Michelle de Guercello, and he also was taught, t teaching me a lot about music. And then it was just like, just, you know, just keep on trying to learn all the time. I still basically, that's basically all I'm trying to do right now, still at this point, you know? And, yeah, uh, and, but man, I, I have so much appreciation for you learning that method. I, I imagine looking at the paper, you know, uh, not for nothing, but kids who are coming out of school now have, they can see like any number of people playing something on YouTube and they can go, oh, I'm not, I'm not saying that, 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 that they have yeah. some easier, but you probably didn't have the situation where you could go, oh, I'm just going to Google like 20 people and see exactly how to do this thing. That's true. I, 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 this, there was nothing. There was like, I would go to the music store in Switzerland, which, I mean, there was just, it wasn't like music, music store here in New York, you know. So it was like one or two methods on how to play the harmonica and all of them were basically teaching people how to play country or blues at some, that's, you know, but it was quite basic. I and I was just, on, 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 yeah, on exactly. The diatonic harmonica. Yes. There was nothing about chromatic, but I got lucky. One guy in Geneva was playing chromatic and could play some classical pieces on the harmonica, um, a chromatic harmonica, and he taught me how to play a, a couple pieces by Bach and Chopin, and it really kind of opened up my eyes of and ears of what was possible on the instrument. And then, of course, I, I, like the fact that you know, discovering Toots, what he was able to do, I, I was like, okay, I guess this is this is a, a new world for me. And um, and then I had great teachers also at the new school that were like, okay. Toots is doing amazing things, but you got to kind of try to go and, and find other things, you know. And actually, the truth is also I met Toots early on. I met him when I was about, I don't know, maybe 17, still in Switzerland. And he asked me right after a concert, he put me on the spot. It was like, can you play a tune for me? And I was like, oh, man, like, come on. <laughs> so I tried to play something, you know. Play the blues. I, I got lost. I couldn't play. It was just I, could, I couldn't handle it. It was too much pressure. But he could see and hear what you know the potential, and he kind of was like, "Okay, let, let's go for a walk." So we we went for a walk, and he was like, "You know, if you like what I do, you should take this set as as an example, and um, you should then be able to detach yourself from that and create your own voice and find something that is really your own. You shouldn't just kind of copy it and stay with that only, you know? So that's, that's basically what I try to do ever since. It was basically the best piece of advice I've ever had and received from anybody. And then having the chance to, 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 uh, work with, uh, you know, Herbie and, and Pat and Pat Metheny and, and all these people were, really a huge chance for me to try to reach for something else, you know, and, and Steve Coleman was also a great um, uh, help for that, as well as somebody like Cassano Wilson, you know, yeah. they, they, were, they were great in terms of doing some music where I had to just find something else to play, you know, I couldn't just, yeah. re just play whatever Toots created on the instrument, you know. 
Yeah, because and you worked with so many different. You know, you you've formed multi-record and touring relationships with several different artists. And I guess Jimmy Scott was kind of your first regular. Yeah, as absolutely. Like I was still in school. I was still studying at the new school, and he gave me a. a he asked me to join his band, his touring band. I, basically, I, I was invited to do a recording session where he was like a special guest. And he, he, he heard me and he was like, we should be in touch. You know, we, we should, uh, I, I would love for, for you to, to play some of our music. And I was like, oh, absolutely. And then he disappeared. I, never, I could never find him again, you know, no telephone number, nothing. Eventually, we, we were able to uh, connect again. I went to one of his concerts, he gave me his, his info. And I would call him once in a while, and he would be like, you know, I'm coming to New York, and you should come and, and hang out. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And eventually, I called him once, and he was like, yeah, come to this show. I'm doing a week at the Iridium. And I was like, I will be there. So I went there on the second night for the second set, and I saw him during the break at the bar. And he looked at me and I, when I arrived, and he was like, where were you yesterday, man? We were waiting for you. I was like, what, wow. what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, man, you... <laughs> You, you gotta play, and he was like, "As a matter of fact, we're about to jump. We're about to to start playing. You know, jump, jump on the band thing, man." And he, he basically put me on the spot. He wanted to see how I was gonna handle the music and myself and and everything. And that was the audition. And at the end of the night, he was like, "You got the gig. Come back tomorrow with the tuxedo." <laughs> that was it. That's great, man. <laughs> yeah, that and was then, a crazy story. You made like four records, four or five records. Yeah, uh, absolutely about. Yeah, four or five, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah then, I, I, it was the best way to learn how to play a ballad, you know? You know, yeah. you got it. Right after he he talks about his his life through whatever ch song he would sing, you had to play a, a solo, you know? And it was the slowest tempo I've ever had to play, ever. I mean, it was like crazy. 16 bars felt like four choruses, man, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Isn't it amazing to work with these, the, you know, like these elder leaders because they really, you know, they don't have anything that they're trying to prove anymore and they're just they're exactly. going to take their time. Exactly. You know? They're just going to go through as the essence of music and just be like, okay, this is what it's about. Nothing else. Right. And, uh, but it's, it's incredible to have that, uh, ch the chance to play with, with these people. Uh, at, for me at a young age, <clears throat> it, yeah. was, uh, it was incredible. And then you started, uh, was it shortly after that you started playing with Marcus Miller and his band? I played with Marcus Miller right after I played with Pat Metheny. Uh, right. So it was in 2000, uh, well, let's about talk about 2006. Pat Let, huh? Let's talk about Pat Metheny then, because mm -hmm. uh, you know, I definitely want to ask about Pat. Uh, Pat sure. is very, he's, he's very specific and particular about recordings. Mm -hmm. And you recorded this you recorded on the way up and you played yeah, a little video exactly. in the way up. Yeah. And uh, I was curious about how that was, you know, you're certainly such a lyrical player and Pat is all about melody and, and, and how was that process? Yeah, how did that I, feel do, well, doing that stuff? Well, Pat was also really paying attention to what I was doing before we started. I mean, obviously when we started playing together. So at the time I was playing with Cassano Wilson and we would kind of cross paths here and there in Europe or, you know, like, somewhere in different festivals and he he would kind of stay to check out the set and particularly because he wanted to check out what i was doing with the music Kasana was creating and i guess he really liked it so eventually he called me and um we i, I would go to his house and we would play and talk and that was kind of a form of audition that i, that I went through for for a while you know i i, I went to his house several times and eventually, um, uh, I went a uh, last time, and Lau was there with uh, Lau Mays and, and Steve Robbie was there, and they were like, "Okay, we would like for you to to record this this new this new album we're working on." And um, so it was literally like I don't know, maybe a Tuesday, and they were like, "Oh, middle of the week," and they were like, "Next Monday, we need you in the studio like all week." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, great." So they gave me a pile of music and um, they were like, get ready. <laughs> so I, I, had, I had to just learn all this music. And, uh, but I was ready by the time, you know, it was time to record. I was there and we, 
I was the last person that was recording uh, on, on the record, I believe. And um, it was literally like eight hours a day for for an entire week, maybe 10 days. Wow. I don't know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's such an intense recording schedule. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for, for how it feels on the record, because it's, it feels like a continuous, you know, it yeah, feels that's, like that's, kind of that's, that's what it is. But the challenge for me was to be able to kind of adapt uh, uh, or, or be able to play as, as being part of the group, even though the music has had, had been recorded. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a live recording. They, I think the rhythm section had, had recorded live, but then they decided later on that they wanted me to come and join and, and, and play some parts of it. So I had to, to create something that felt like I was part of the live experience, you know, not just, just adding something for the sake of adding something. So that was also the thing that was, uh, that was uh, uh, challenging. And, uh, but it was an amazing experience. You know, I really learned a lot. I learned a lot about everything from writing music to arranging to everything, producing. Mm. And you, you must have picked up some of this instinct about being part of the group from Cassandra, because I know Cassandra is all about, she wants to be in the middle of the swirling and she wants, she wants the band to kind of move around and she wants some surprises and, and stuff, yeah. you know? Absolutely, but Cassandra's stuff is much more like I've, I've whenever I've recorded with her, I was always there uh, right away, right there during. It was always live. We just record live, you know. And then uh, she wanted also when whenever we were playing, doing concerts, it was all about from very simple forms, whatever we were gonna create each night, you know. So, and and. It was kind of unique in a sense that she was really embracing different types of music that no other jazz player really embraced as as well maybe as she did, except maybe for Pat, like um, like you know almost like country music or um, uh, folk music or you know all that kind of stuff. Like she really really was in that world and it was really genuine and beautiful and. Um, and it was a great learning experience for me as well, because it was just like, it really fit the sound of the instrument that I had, like it, it was perfect for this kind of music. But at the same time, it was new. It was not something, for instance, like Toots did a whole lot. He never performed with Cassandra, he never, you know. So it was like quite a new thing that I had to kind of, yeah, try to aim for, you know? Yeah. I I think it's so interesting, the idea with you with Cassandra and voice, you know, because you play so lyrically and, and you you blend like a voice. So it's almost like you become another accompaniment to her voice in a way. Yeah, but that was the goal. Like it was really like, uh, she always kind of referred to me as her alter ego. Like she was like, okay, I, 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 I love for you to just bring something special and, and, and it would give her a little bit of space. She could kind of lay back a little bit and then come back. You know, it, it was all about that. So it was, it was definitely about having two voices in this uh, in this ensemble, in a way. Yeah, yeah, and that must have been. It was probably a bit different do, playing with Marcus than after this, because Marcus, at least as far as my perception, I think that he he wants people to more kind of step out and be like, you know, and have your moment. And yeah, I mean, the great thing about all these amazing leaders is that they all created their world. So I, I really. For in each group, in each new group like that, I had to um, kind of re-learn how to play, you know, almost. I, I can develop something new on the instrument and on my musical approach to be able to really fit and, and serve the music the best I could, which was an amazing um, uh, way to sort of like really force me, but in a gentle way to, 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 to like really push me, I would rather say, to, to, to grow, you know, all the time which is like a dream come true in a sense. It's like, you know, each time I would, okay, join another band, like, you know, and I just had to just step up, you know, and just come up with something that would really, really be about the music they're representing. So with Marcus Miller, it was the same thing. It was like, okay, he has a world that's quite different from anything I've done before. And let me figure out whatever I can do on my instrument and, and, and see how I can really bring something special to this music. And same thing again, like Toot Stillman's never played this kind of music before. So I really had to to come up with something new, like, you know, 
that would really work with his music. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was super effective. And then 2007, I guess you were still touring with Marcus and you did this beautiful record that I guess was kind of your first record, a duo record with Andy Milne. Oh yeah, Sonar. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, well, thank you. Most of this record actually is, is completely improvised, you know, like, like we would just literally, he would be on the, on the piano and we press play, I mean, record and that was it. Let's see what happens. No, nothing, no, not even a word about the music. Like, okay, let's just play in this key or whatever. It was nothing like, let's just play, see what happens. More of half, I think it's probably about 75% of the record is like that. And then you have maybe two or three compositions that are really like written and, and you know, uh, structured and, 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 and through composed. But, but for the most part, it was just complete improvisation. So it was, it was extremely challenging, but in a good way, you know, but like, it was like, I would, I think we did maybe two days in the studio. I, at the end of these two days, I was exhausted because I had to <laughs> be, I, it was, I was, it was being on the edge the entire time, you know, the entire time, you know, just all wow. about listening. You know, like listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and this that second record you made, uh, your self-titled record, Greg Wildmore, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, produced by Federico from Marcus. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Bank. exactly. Yeah. So we worked a lot on the on the on the pre-production and post-production. Uh, Federico and I, like we we co-wrote a lot of stuff, like a bunch of intros and outros. Because the, the whole record is almost like structured around two suites, you know, like there's the Crepuscule suite and then there's children's suite, children's song suite. And those two suites were like, an, a, I mean, an amount of work that was crazy. Like we, we were in Federico's basement for about, <laughs> I think a week, literally, like working on those intros and outros and then we, because I, I had the, the 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 tune like the the main songs. I had it sort of of together, but we we worked on it a bit to restructure it. But we wanted to kind of get the live experience on that on those moments, like the the, the main body of the, the like the song, the main song. But the intro and the outro were completely composed before going in the studio. But it was a, 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 a huge amount of work. And um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really still really proud about this this record. You know, there's there's a couple songs like Prayer that I still feel have are really strong, you know, and, and saying something really uh, quite also unique. You know, it's just not nothing quite like that. It's a great record. And are do you I always ask this of composers, are you a quick writer? Are you are you are you a happy writer? You know, people People write stuff I compose and I hate everything that I write. Right. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I am, um, it really all depends. You know, there's certain times where a song will write itself, literally. Like you go, I, I write on piano and I'm, I'm kind of old school. So I'll have a piece of paper, like music sheet, and I'll write down the music. You know, I, I don't record anything. I just write down stuff. That's the process for me, which I love. And I also love to do that because once I go in the studio, I don't want to have a demo that everybody's trying to imitate. I want to have something fresh and new that no, who, who knows? I don't even know what, what, how it will come out, what it will be, you know? And that's, that's what I, I found to be exciting. Uh, that may change in the future, but as of now, it's, uh, it's been like that always. So, um, yes, it, it, the, my, the, the, the process of writing for me is, it's been, at first I, I was quite, self-conscious about writing because I've had the chance to play with all these people and I've never really wrote much. And then I was like, okay, let me try to write something. I was like, man, this is, this is horrible. What I'm, I'm writing is really, really bad. <laughs> but what I did is I forced myself to write every single day, you know, for, for a long time. Every day I would write something, every day. And, and eventually I would literally spend like maybe six to eight hours a day writing. So in, I wouldn't go into like trying to be creative and inspired and 
come up with a, a great theme or just like that. I mean, that can happen once in a while, but I would go into finding exercises, writing exercise, you know, like, okay, let me write a song that is based on a fit, you know, or let me write a song that goes with these kind of changes, uh, whatever. Like I would give myself a, um, a, a, a starting point, a, a way to, to try to start writing something. And then from that, I would see where it would guide me just listening and seeing where, what I liked. And this way it would, it would, um, it would, help me not to get stuck and and be like you know if you just for me at least when i, I just try to write for the sake of writing without any sort of, uh, of of sense of what i'm doing very often i'll be i'll be stuck like i'll be just like man i just can't write anything but then when i give myself something certain tools to be able to write i'll i'll just come up with stuff uh pretty uh on that I, I found to be, I mean, it may take me days sometimes to finish a day, uh, uh, two, sorry, or even weeks, but I'll, I'll keep on going and I'll keep really uh, enjoying the, the process, you know. But if I just try to just write for the sake of writing, I, I, I have the tendency to get stuck. Well, I, I think you, you've gotten better and better at it, and it's really beautiful. And you, and you continue to write, uh, you know, and I'm going through these albums because I want to talk about all of them. The 2016 album, Wanted, you worked with the uh, arranger and brilliant pianist John Coward. Had you worked with him with Cassandra? Or when yeah, did you meet John? Yeah. Well, I met John, uh, I think, with John Ellis, actually. Uh, and mm -hmm. then I, um, I sat in a couple of times also with Brian Blade's band, and, and uh, we, we had a good vibe. We always had a great vibe. And, and then... Cassandra was actually auditioning different pianists for, for her band. And I thought that John Coward would be a great match. Like he could play just about anything and especially the kind of music she likes to play and the sensitivity she had. And it, it worked out like. So when I was starting to, to, to write this music and, and arrange this, this, the music for this record, I thought of, yeah, John Coward to, to help me for a couple of songs. And uh, yeah, I thought it, it was nice. That particular record was the exact opposite than the, the one before right. uh, produced by Federico because it was, I would write really simple tunes. I didn't uh, work on pre-production or post-production Post-production, I did write, a lot. I work a lot, but pre-production, I, I, I didn't work, work on it at all. And it was intentionally, I really wanted to just go in the studio, give them a music sheet and see what happens. Give them almost no instruction, you know, and just see what happens. And then that would kind of guide me and tell me what to do with this recording if I needed post-production or if I could just release it and mix it just like that. And, and that's what happened. Yeah. Well, it's, it, that's also a beautiful record. And then this record that I didn't know about, it's actually, by the way, your mic sounds like it's crackling a little bit. Oh, sorry, 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 around. sorry, sorry. I'll okay. do it like that, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to hold it that close because now it's maybe overdriving a little bit, but- Is it better like this? If it's flopping on your shirt, then- Yeah, is it better like this? still, no. <laughs> it's okay, yeah, it's fine. No, this, this record that you made with uh, Edmar Castaneda. Yeah, Harp vs. Is Harp. Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. and You'd, and I noticed I started to see this pattern with you. You know, you've made a bunch of duo records, and and I think they're all beautiful. Thank you, and thank you. Do you feel like that's something that you're drawn towards, or is something that just happened? I mean, I know it allows a lot of space for your voice and your instrument. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a couple of things. It's just like, for, for instance, the way this duo with Andy Milne started was. I was part of the depth theory group that he put together years ago. And we would always kind of, in the middle of the set, take a moment and, and play something just in duo. And it sounded so good, we thought hey, sh we should do a record like that. And it's kind of exactly the same thing that happened with Edmar. I was part of his world ensemble um, group. That was like a, literally, I think, a nonet. So it's like nine people. It's pretty, pretty big. But at some point in the set, we would always take a moment and do a duo. And it sounded so beautiful. 
he really was like, you know, at some point we, we're going to have to record something just in duo. So eventually we did. We started playing a little bit, did a few shows. It went really well. It helped us also to kind of choose the material we could record that could really sound great just in duo. And eventually we just went in the studio and recorded. Yeah, it's it's great. And and I want to talk about I want to talk about another project that you're in that's definitely not duo and pretty loud at times. And not always loud, but you know, I'm talking about Jeff Tane Watts. Oh yeah, yeah. Because that's my man. That's Jeff, my man. I love I mean, Jeff Tane Watts, but he can put some volume on the stage. Oh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but it's a funny thing because I met Jeff when I was part of uh, Ravi's quintet oh, and which was uh, quite a while ago I, I guess 20 years ago and we've still we still play together like uh he still yeah. invites me to play in his band we were supposed to go to brazil uh in march and uh, obviously it got canceled but we hopefully at some point we'll go and uh so we, it's still really a joy to play with him and i still learn a whole lot and it's it's you know it's incredible but at the same time, you know, it's it's really, it's all about, for all of us, it's all about music. So it's true that it can get quite loud, but if that's what the music asks for, that's, we're all there for that. And then, you know, he can also play, I mean, his, his, his swing, his everything is just so incredible. You know, it's, it's such a, a, a special, special treat to play with him, you know, no it's matter, so hard. it's incredible. So yeah, it's, it's been really special. So I recorded with him uh, um, on his record named Bar Talk. I think. Bar Talk, right? That was my mm -hmm. first time recording with him, and it, for me it was incredible because I, I think I was just I just graduated, and he asked me to join uh, the the band and, and record as a as a special guest, and I went there, and I think it was literally right after. 9-11 maybe just around that time and he um he w we went to a studio upstate and it was just incredible for me because it was like it was Brantford Marsalis it was like James Genius it was you know like I was hanging out with Ravi and then Ravi was like yo you going back to the city and I was like yeah like okay I'll drive you back and on the way back he's like what do you think about going to see and visit uh, Jack DeJanet? I was like, what? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so we went to hang out with Jack at his house for about, I mean, I don't know, half a day or an entire day. And I was like, what a crazy weekend. Like, I just recorded with Jeff Tain Watts, and then I just hung out with Jack DeJanet for another day. That was just surreal for me, you know? Yeah. And, man, and Tain is so inviting, right? In and you re you recorded on Blue Volume One and Two as well, more recently. Exactly, exactly. More more recently, I recorded on his uh, his uh, Blue record. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. And and of course, you've been guest with some pretty big names. Can you talk about any of those Prince and Elton and Sting and those? Well, with Prince, for instance, it was uh, he got really kind of close um uh with uh he got like a good vibe with son wilson so he invited her it was during that time where he would invite like jazz acts you know like esperanza spalding and son wilson and those kind of people to come in and open up for him and most of the time he would either ask them to come and join them for a song after or he would join the the the, the opening act he would just suddenly just show up and 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 sing a song, and that's what happened with us. Like we we were playing a our set, and we knew we had, there was one song of Prince we had to learn. We learned it, and then suddenly, who shows up? Prince, you know, it's like oh. So we played that with him. It was great, and then you know, listen to his concert it was amazing. And then after that, he was like, "Yo, you guys stay here," and we jammed with him all night. Like he had like this backstage little like stage uh, set up and it was like Maceo and and Larry Graham and Sheila E and you know it was <laughs> it was crazy man I, I was like in the middle like jamming and Prince was on guitar just like just jamming and for hours you know we just jamming yeah it's crazy yeah you like to just do that right you get like yeah 
he had this stamina, he had this thing about music he wanted to play all, I guess, all the time. So, I mean, I heard so many stories about people getting phone calls in the middle of the night, like, yeah, I need you, it's like three in the morning, and they would just play <laughs> and, or record something like all night, you know, I just... Right. So that was my, my little story with Prince. And then Elton John? Yeah, so I did um, the, um, the Rainforest concert uh, that is organized by Sting's wife. And they needed a harmonica for this. So they apparently they called Stevie because that's him on the original song. And he was like, no, I'm, I'm not coming for, for one song, I'm sorry. So they were like, okay, well, it's called Toots. And Toots was in Belgium and was like, man, I'm not coming for one song. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm too old for this. And they were desperate. They were like, man, so who can we call? I mean, and, and he gave my name. It was really, really nice of him. Toots gave give them uh, my info and they called me. And then um, I played that song with uh, Elton John. And I played also a little song also with Sting there. That's great. Well, uh, certainly they know who you are now, for sure. And they won't See be what? looking to those other people first. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I really want to talk about this record that you just made, which is mm -hmm. so beautiful and such a, a pleasant surprise. And again, it's another very spacious record. This record, Americana, that you made with Bill Frizzell and Romain Collin. Yeah. Did I say that correctly, Romain yeah. Collin? I, I mean, the French for weight is Romain Collin, you know, but oh. they say Romain Collin in, I think, the Romain Collin. And it's just trio, and it's it's so beautiful, and, and you all compose on it with the exception of three songs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, a, it was one of those things, like, I, I mean, uh, Romain and I wanted to do something together, and we were talking about what kind of music we could do. We both really love melodies, you know. I'm, I'm, I just, I just love melodies, you know. There's just nothing like a pretty melody. So we were thinking about maybe recording pop songs or whatever, something, you know, really uh, beautiful. And and um, we were just looking at material and songs and. And eventually we started kind of looking in that direction because we both realized that that style of music is something we both love. I connected to it playing with Cassandra Wilson originally, you know, like Cassandra was, was in our world. So it was really natural for me to, to, to do it, record this. And I felt it was absolutely genuine and it was something necessary because I just feel like nowadays there's there's a lack for this, you know. There's this this we need more melodies, you know. There's a lot of great great records, the great um, players, composers, arrangers, but I I just I want to hear melodies, you know. And um, amen. So yeah, so that that's what this record's all about. It's all about melodies. So we were thinking about maybe doing it in duo or maybe having a guest or two. And Roman went to the Vanguard and heard Bill Frizzell. And he was like, you know what? I think maybe Bill would be the perfect guest. And I was like, yo, this, this is actually the perfect idea because we've been speaking, me and, and, and Bill, forever to do something together. I recorded with him a long time ago. And then after that, we never really did anything. So let me reach out, which I did. And uh, he he accepted. He was excited about the idea. And then uh, we barely like rehearsed. Like I think we rehearsed. Like we looked at the tunes once, and then we went to the studio and recorded it. And and within the first or second take, the record was done. Like it was one of those, you know, where we just recorded once, maybe twice, and that's it. That's it's done. Wow. You know. And are you guys? Uh, did you ever dis discuss touring that? That thing? Yeah, I mean, we we probably will do some live stuff, but I mean, obviously, right now is is impossible. But um, Bill is it's been so busy that uh, we um, most of the time, uh, whatever we've done so far, we did it with uh, Marvin Sewell on guitar, and uh, it, it looks like in the future that will be uh, him as well. You know, so it's, it's like a great fit also. Music. Well, it's a beautiful record, and I would advise anybody who's who's watching to go out and buy it and buy a physical copy, an actual copy of the record, rather than just Spotify it. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Out. But you know, oh. the, the funny thing is, this record has, has a life of its own. Like, it's really interesting because I'm, I was nervous to release a record in the middle of this pandemic. And, okay, let's see what happens. But the label, the label really insisted because they were like, listen, people really need music and this kind of music, I think they were yeah. thinking. So I was, I was like, okay, like, like, let's try. And um, so we, di we did, but we, we decided that um, um, we wanted to release a couple things on Spotify before, like two songs, like, uh, um, so we, we, uh, released stacks uh that's a, a bon iver song or first and then uh wichita lyman and both songs got amazing response on, on spotify you know crazy like i think it's over four hundred thousand uh streams stacks four hundred thousand yeah. that so it's oh. like oh, wow that's that's crazy so, and then now we released the record. It's been released for about two weeks. Uh, it was released on April 24th. And we just got the news like this morning that, you know, it's number one in in Germany on iTunes Jazz, you know, like, wow, okay. You know, and we haven't done a concert, you know, nothing. It's great so music. It's, it, yeah, I, well, thank you. Yeah, this, it, but we had no idea what would be like the response, you know. So it's nice to see that actually people are, are connecting. Yeah. Well, congratulations, and it's a fitting birthday present since yesterday was your birthday. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, 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 it was. <laughs> thank you. Stefan Gitel, who's here watching, told me that, yeah, I think he told me that yesterday or the day before. Because it's his birthday as well, you know. Yeah. It was. <laughs> we have the same birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Gregoire, thank you so much for talking to me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Really a pleasure to, to hear about your, your process. Thank you. And, and hear about your development and the way that you're you continue to grow and becoming you know the the musician that you are it's it's well, great thank you thanks. so much thank you man thanks a lot and and be well stay safe and i look forward to more music from you yeah yeah thank you okay thanks a lot thanks for joining me for this episode of the right key if you enjoyed the episode there's a lot more coming please click the subscribe and like buttons below. If you want to know more about me or our guests, you can find lots of information in the link just below the video. See you next time.